Hello and welcome to this Getting Started in Adobe Illustrator video. We're going to look at how to use rulers, guides, alignment tools, and discuss stroke and fill. I've started with a new document that is letter sized, eight and a half by 11 inches, and CMYK mode, high resolution. To turn on the rulers, we're going to go to view and scroll down to rulers. Here it says show rulers, which is the shortcut command R or control R on a PC. You can see here that the rulers are on the top and left edges. So let's go ahead and find command R on the keyboard to toggle those on and off. On the rulers, you can right click and here you can change your units of your increments. So we are in inches and we can easily change that. You can also change your increments or units going to Illustrator Preferences or on a PC that's under Edit Preferences at the bottom. And here you'll find units and the general units here can be changed. Next, let's look at how to create guides from these rulers. Just from clicking and dragging on the ruler, you can see my dotted line. You can pull out a new guide here. So from the left, we can pull a guide and we can continue to pull guides as we need. As long as the guides are selectable, you can delete them. If you're unable to select your guides, go to View, Guides, and we want, mine's currently unlocked, but if it were locked, I would be unable to select this. So you would go to View, Guides, Unlock Guides, or that shortcut is here, which is Alt, Command, semicolon. So now that we have those unlocked, you can see how I can select and delete as needed, or I can add additional guides by clicking and dragging from the ruler. So how do we know where these guides are located? Well, if we select one of them and click on this transform panel, if you don't have that open, you can go to window and transform to open that palette. You can see here it's not included with our classic Essentials workspace. So with Transform open or from your top control bar, you can see that the location of this guide is minus, it's off the canvas or off the artboard. So let's go ahead and say we want that to be one inch on our artboard. And let's say we want this other to be one inch from the left side. We can either do some math in our head, or since we know our document is 8.5 inches width, we can do 8.5 minus 1, and that will give us a guide at 7.5. So I wanted you to note that you can do math within your transformation values. So for instance, if we had a guide here, and I wanted it to be twice the width on the y-axis, you can do asterisk 2, enter and it will double whatever that value was. So you can add guides top and bottom, left and right. You can also create a shape and make that a guide. So maybe we would use this as a guide. It's currently a shape. So with this shape, we can convert it to a guide by going to view, guide, make guide, which is command five. So now this object is a guide that we can move. Or if I undo Command Z, I can actually duplicate this by holding down the Option key and Shift to keep it in line. If we need to revert this back to a shape, we can do View, Guides, Release Guides. So that's mainly if we have converted an object into a guide that we would make or release the guide. Next, let's talk about Smart Guides. So I currently have Smart Guides on, shortcut Command U, and I wanna show you what Smart Guides do. So let's say we have this rectangle. I will convert it back to a, a shape. So you can see, as I'm moving, you'll see these pink notations, and you'll see some alignments happening, like this pink bar in the center or as I touch the border of this document. So those are smart guides. They help you align objects exactly. So if I were to create another object, 
and go to my main selection tool, I can drag this object and know that it's directly aligned with this rectangle. So if I zoom in very closely, I can see that those objects are perfectly aligned. If we need to hide the guides, so for instance, you were having trouble seeing the object because of the guides, if you need to hide them, you can go to View, Guides, Hide Guides, and that shortcut is Command semicolon. So I want you to try toggling that right now by going to Command semicolon, and you can toggle that on and off. Another place you might want to put the guides would be in your Layers panel. You can create a new layer with the plus sign. Select your guides, only your guides. And you can see those are selected within the layer. I'm going to click on this square and drag it into this red layer. So now those guides are on this layer. And that way, while I'm working, I could lock and hide that layer. So there's a couple different ways that you can show and hide your guides and organize. So now let's look at what happens when we have smart guides turned off. So now if I'm moving this circular shape you can see I really have no idea if this is going to align directly or not. It's much more difficult to get that exactly aligned. And you can see when I hover near the edge, there's no magenta highlights showing up. So smart guides can be very useful and help you align objects. It can also help you with centering. You can see it can also help you if I duplicate to evenly space objects, I'm holding down Option and dragging the object to duplicate. So I could tell right there that they were equidistant, which leads us into discussing more about the alignment tools. I'm going to go ahead and drag this panel into my other panels. And let's just offset these circles so we can talk about the alignment. So right now, these are obviously out of a line. I've used my direct or my main selection tool to select all of the circles. And with the align palette or up here at the top, you will see we can horizontally align these left, center, or right, and we can vertically align them. We can also equally distribute objects. So let's go through these pretty quickly. We can vertically align them to the top which they're the same size currently. I will reduce this one just so we can see. So we can align to the top, we can align to the bottom, we can align vertically centered, and we can align them distributed. So now we know this one is perfectly in the middle. I want you to take note that we are aligning to the selection of the objects. So if we zoom out, we're not actually aligned to the center of the artboard. So in order to do that, we need to find align to artboard or up here, align to artboard. And we're going to need to group this if we're going to align the entire group because let's see what happens when it's not grouped. It centers them all together. So if we want to treat them as a group, we need to go to object group or the shortcut command G. So now if we go to our layers panel, you'll see we have a group of the ellipse, multiple ellipses. If we want to ungroup it, we can go to Object, Ungroup. I'm going to go ahead and undo so you can see when I do a center alignment to the artboard that now all the objects as a group are centered. We can also center it vertically. So just as we centered this smaller circle between those two, we can also center multiple objects. So these multiple groups can be centered and distributed evenly. Right now we have it up with the artboard. If I undo, I can distribute them to the selection only. So there are many interesting things you can do with your alignment tools. I also want you to note within transform, whenever we are transforming an object, you can change the reference point. 
So for instance, let's say we want this rectangle to be a half inch from the top and left. Well, if we start transforming based on the reference point in the center, we're going to need to move the reference point to this top left corner. So on the x-axis, we want 0.5. And on the y, we want 0.5. So now we know that this rectangle is aligned based on that top left corner and is a half inch on each side there. With our black selection tool, we can increase the size of this rectangle. And as I increase it, you can see the width change. If you want to be the, an exact width with our reference point on any point of the left side, you can update the value. And as you see what happened, it's scaled proportionately. What we really want to do is to unlink the constraint, and we only want the width value to be changed. So if we scale the objects manually, you can freely transform, or you can change the values independently, or you can constrain the portions. The constraint only works whenever you are individually changing the value or if you hold down shift while scaling the object. So I'm holding down shift right now to keep the proportions. So whenever I create a new square or rectangle to make it a square, I will hold down shift, click and drag to constrain the proportions. If I'm creating a, an ellipse or circle, I will use shift as I click and drag to constrain it to a perfect circle size. Now let's talk about the stroke and fill. The default within Illustrator is found over here, and you can see our fill is white and the stroke is black. If we want to swap those, we can click this double-sided curved arrow, or we can do Shift X to reverse those. So Shift X is swapping the fill and the stroke. So if I draw a shape right now, the default will be a black stroke with a white fill. And you can see that because when I duplicate and add a new object, it's layered on top versus if we remove the fill with this none fill, now we only have a stroke outline. So if we need to get back to the default, we can tap D on the keyboard to bring it back to the default. Or with the fill selected, you can go over to your swatches and you can choose whatever color you want the fill to be. For the fill, you can also change it to a gradient. You can see there is a solid color, gradient, none, and there are shortcuts for those. So let's click on gradient. The default gradient looks like this, white to black. You can change the gradient type from linear to radial or freeform. You can also make the stroke a gradient. So to do that, the easiest way would be to click on the fill and drag it to the stroke. So it's a little difficult to see now, but if we increase the stroke width, either manually or you can hold down shift and type your arrows, you can see now that the stroke is a gradient. I'm going to go ahead and tap D to change that back to the default. So depending on which of the stroke and the fill is in the foreground, so right now the fill is in the foreground versus now the stroke is, will determine which of those changes with the swatch color. So right now the stroke is green and if I swap or hit X on the keyboard, I can now change the fill color. Or you can drag and drop either way if you want to match the same color. There are additional color libraries within the flyout of swatches. There are all sorts of swatch libraries here, including a gradient library, various ones. So if we just open one gradient library, we can click on one of these or keep clicking through as you'd like. And to navigate through the libraries, you can load the next swatch library by using these arrows here at the bottom. Next, let's talk about 
the ordering of objects. So right now we can see this gradient ellipse is above this other one. Well, what if we want that to be below? If we go to our layers panel, you can see that it's above or it's on top. You can drag and move that manually or a much easier way that you'll want to learn how to use is to go to select the object and go to arrange, bring to front or bring forward. So you can see the shortcut here is command and right bracket to bring forward and command left bracket to send backwards. So I want you to look for command or control on your computer, hold that down and find your square brackets. So left moves the object below and right bracket moves it to the top. So if I copy and paste, the new object is going to be at the very top so we're working from the bottom up. So if I hit command left bracket, it's going to go below that one, but it's still above this other ellipse. So I need to do command shift bracket if we had multiple objects we need to send this behind. Let's talk a little bit more about the stroke. So I'm going to create a square and it just has the defaults. If I go to the stroke panel, you can see here or up here we can increase the size of the stroke. Within the stroke panel, we're gonna find even more options. Since we have a rectangle, we can change the corner to a rounded joint or a beveled joint. We can align the stroke to the inside or to the outside of this box. If we have a line, a stroke, you can change the cap to rounded or projecting so it extends outside of this anchor point. So the native is this butt cap. Let's say we make a square with the default and we click off. Let's say we need to match this stroke or at any time if you need to match another object's stroke or fill. Select the object and go to your eyedropper tool or eye for shortcut. And now I can sample another object's stroke and fill. So this has a white fill with a black stroke and all these attributes. Let's say we want to make this a dashed stroke. With the stroke or object selected, go to dashed line, and here we can change the dash length and the gap. And you can use your arrows or type values manually. Let's change our stroke alignment to center again and the default corner. Let's go ahead and make it dashed and let's sample this line right here. So with the stroke alignment in the center, we have an option to align the dashes to the corners because right now you can see they're kind of offset. So if I click on that, now we know that the corners are aligned with the dashes. So this is kind of a coupon look. We can make this a dotted line if we make the dash a zero and do a rounded cap and adjust for the weight for the size of the dots. And you can still change the gap if you'd like. I think that's a good place to stop with the stroke and fill tools.